tonight we're going to learn a lot about bees. I can say that, and I and their habitat and how to optimize that. I was at the Houston Rodeo a few years ago, and they had a beekeepers put on a an exhibit of the bees. And I have to tell you, it was in the children's section of the rodeo. Of course, I went because I'm a child. And the kids learned a lot, but so did I. And he almost had us all convinced to have uh, hives in our yards. So it was uh, really great that the beekeepers are uh, helping us. And then also, and this is from where our speaker is from, I was at Texas A&M a couple of years ago and I got a chance to taste some of the honey and that was a lot of fun too. So tonight we're going to expand our knowledge in this area. Our speaker tonight is very well educated. Julian obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Ecology, Behavior and Evolution from the University of California in San Diego, and then went on and got her PhD in Neurobiology and Behavior from Cornell University. She was a National Science Foundation postdoc research fellow at North Carolina State University. And then for our benefit, she came to us at Texas A&M and they have a big laboratory that focuses on bees. She, besides her research, which she will talk about tonight, she also teaches honeybee biology. So thank you um, and welcome to our talk. I would like to thank you for this invitation. One of the hidden benefits of staying at home during these difficult times is that I get to speak to groups that I normally wouldn't. So this is one of them and I, and I appreciate the invitation. You mentioned before I'm, I'm the head of the Honeybee Research Program at Texas A&M. And we have a very diverse research program. I have currently four PhD students and several undergraduate students. I typically have anywhere from four to six PhD students, each uh, doing work on different areas of honeybee health. We focus mostly on honeybees because of the land grant mandate for this position, but we do collaborate with people that have expertise in native pollinators, um, including some um, master gardeners. I've done a few talks for Garden Success, uh, which is a really fun radio show that I would definitely recommend if you guys haven't heard it before, it's by Rick Spector, uh, one of the cooperative extension agents or extension specialists uh, here in College Station. And he, it's an awesome show. I've pulled in a few times just to ask questions about gardening because I, I have to say that I'm not a very good gardener. But um, over the last couple of years, I've gotten really involved in work related to honeybee nutrition. In the past, my Bread and butter has been reproduction and the uh, biology of honeybee queens and their drone or male uh, mates. But given the interests of a couple of my graduate students, we started working on questions related to nutrition a few years ago, and I'm going to present some of that work today. Before I go on, I want to mention that we have a very successful online uh, lecture series called At Home Beekeeping Seminars. Uh, we started this over a year and a half ago when uh, people were stuck at home. And so uh, my colleague at Auburn University created the what used to be called the Stay at Home Beekeeping Webinar Series. Now it's just at home beekeeping webinar series because we saw that even though people could start moving around and keeping bees outdoors, they still really appreciated this venue. It's free to anyone that wants to join you just Google at home beekeeping webinar and the information will come up. It is every month in the last Tuesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And we basically offer beekeepers professional talks by all the researchers in mostly Southeastern and Southern U.S. universities, including uh, the University of Tennessee, Auburn, Mississippi State, NC State, Louisiana State, um, the USDA, University of Florida. So um, the next talk is happening on January 25th by Dr. Priya Chakrabarty, who's the new assistant professor of pollinator health at Mississippi State University. February 22nd, there will be one on integrated pest management in the hive by Cameron Jack, who's a new assistant professor at the University of Florida. 
March 29th, we have methods of poor controlling varroa that work by Dr. Jennifer Berry at the University of Georgia. So you can watch it live either through Zoom or through Facebook Live, just basically like you guys are doing right now, or you can watch the presentation after the fact, a couple of weeks after, um, for up to a couple of weeks after um, it's presented. So I would definitely encourage you, if you want to learn more about bees, I know that there's a couple of beekeepers in this group right now, so this would be a great opportunity to learn more about what's going on in the research front in the southern U.S. The work that I'm going to present, at least the uh, work that um, uh, the research that we've been working on is in collaboration with my colleague from the Department of Entomology, Dr. Spence Beamer, who is the uh, specialist in insect nutritional ecology and his postdoctoral research associate, Dr. Pierre Lentz. And uh, now Dr. Pierre Lau, who was my PhD student until um, last summer, and he's now a pollination ecologist with the USDA ARS service in Stoneville, Mississippi. And my current PhD student, uh, Alex Payne, who will be defending her PhD in March. And so this has been a large collaborative project with many facets that have also been possible through the cooperation and volunteer work and funding from beekeepers in Austin, College Station area, and in general, uh, beekeepers from Texas and the Eastern Apiculture Society. So I'm going to start from the very basic to the more advanced talks about nutrition and what we've been doing in the lab. And so first I'm gonna start by talking about the building blocks of honeybee nutrition. Those are water. So like all other organisms, uh, honeybees require water for many processes that I will mention briefly. Nectar from flowers and pollen from flowers. Let's start with water. What's the importance of water to honeybees? Water is used for temperature regulation. The bees will bring in water from water sources and deposit them inside the hive and start fanning their wings over the water droplets if the temperature is too hot. And that's called evaporative cooling. So they create a nice mist that will dissipate um, on the surface of the comb and help reduce temperature. It is of course used for their metabolic needs. And mostly it is used to dilute the food that's created by nurse-aged bees, which are the ones that feed the developing larvae so that they can give them that very watery, liquidy uh, larval food. It contains salts that are found to be essential for, for brood uh, provided by the nurse bees. And so if you give them a choice, bees seem to prefer dirty water over clean water. That's one of the reasons why if you give them you know, distilled very clean water and next to, let's say, either a pond or even swimming pool, they will go for the water in the swimming pool or the pond or the creek because they want to get some of those minerals and salts in the dirty water, brackish water that they can't get from uh, the clean resource. Of course, nectar, which is the source of carbohydrates in the colony, is collected from either floral sources um, or from extra, extra floral nectaries sometimes under certain circumstances, or even from uh, honeydew collecting insects that give the honeydew back to the bee. So typically, the bee will collect nectar directly from the flower. Floral nectar is a, an aqueous plant secretion that contains anywhere from five to 80% per percent sugar, depending on the plant species. And that varies not just uh, from plant to plant, but also uh, environmental conditions. Yeah, you know, with global warming and increasing or erratic weather patterns, we are seeing uh, some issues with nectar availability and or uh, sugar content in nectar. Nectar is mainly comprised of sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And the specific mix among those top sugars varies from plant to plant. 
And some sugars like galactose, mannose, rhamnose are either toxic to bees or may cause reduction in longevity to the bees if uh, consumed in large quantities. And some of those have been also known to be toxic to humans, not just the bees. So honey that is created through the processing of nectar from certain toxic plants if consumed by humans can cause a toxic and even in some instances hallucinogenic effects. So that would be the topic of a full other talk. So what is honey? Honey is the transformation of floral nectar inside the honeybee colony for storage purposes. So the nectar is returned to the nest, nectar foragers return to the nest, they have filled their honey stomach or crop with the, with the nectar that come back. And they don't really deposit it themselves into a cell. What they do is they regurgitate it to other bees that are known as unloader bees. And that is through a process seen in this picture here known as food sharing or trophallaxis is the technical term. And when the forager bee is giving back the food um, to the unloader bee. It is also giving that nectar with some enzymes that are released from several glands, particularly a set of glands in the head known as the hypopharyngeal gland. And it adds um, diastase and vertase and glucose oxid oxidase to that trophallactic food that is being received by the unloader bees. Those enzymes are starting to break down the sugars from the nectar into uh, more simple monosaccharides and also add uh, hydrogen peroxide to the transformed nectar for antimicrobial protection. Later on, those same unloader bees and other bees near the unloading area will start fanning their wings so that just similar to evaporative cooling, the workers uh, can help decrease the water content in that processed nectar regurgitate till the water is evaporated so that there's only about 16 to 18 percent water content in that nectar. So when that happens and all of the enzymatic properties are being added and all of this is hap happens, which take a few days, to, which helps prevent yeast growth and antimicrobial properties are being added to, to the honey. That's when the bees will then produce a very thin capping of wax that they will put over what we call ripe honey. And that honey is now being stored and it can be stored for, uh, for months. And so that's why honeybees create this stored thick product known as honey is so, and, and they put that nice coating of wax over it, is that it will help them store the carbohydrate source for the thin months in the winter when there are no floral sources to get food from. So of course we know that honey is really important uh, to honeybees, I just explained why. Um, this is a selfish pitch of our own Aggie honey, which is the only honey that you can call Aggie honey with the trademark from a and because it's produced by our bees in the research apiary. So um, of course, as I just mentioned, the long-term preservation of this honey will enable colonies to survive the periods of nectar thirst. Just to put it in perspective, one worker larva will need about 140 milligrams of honey or the equivalent of nurse bees collecting honey to produce the metabolic processes of, of making brood food to develop property. And adult workers need about four milligrams of sugars per day for just survival, just to, to get by for their uh, caloric needs. So now I wanna move on to pollen, which is kind of the topic that I am most interested in nowadays. And for that, I want to briefly introduce the topic of Melissa Palynology, which is probably of very uh, great interest to all of you guys because you're interested in native plants. And so that mouthful, Melissa Palynology, is the study of pollen that is contained in honey to understand the foraging ecology of honeybees. 
on this picture right here on the right, you see scanning electromicrographs of pollen for, from a wide array of taxonomic groups. So it shows the wide diversity of, of pollen and what it looks like and how the bee needs to have all of these structures in her body to process pollen of such diverse shapes and forms. So the taxonomic source of the pollen indicates what the floral resources are being used by bees, but it also has important consumer values. So back in 2020, unfortunately, we lost the pioneer in the field of Melissa Palynology, Dr. Vaughn Bryant, who was the world's most renowned scientist that would investigate the pollen contained in honey, and therefore it allowed for one to determine whether honey could be called clover honey or just wild flower honey or something more specific like sourwood honey or even having a higher uh, market value like Nanuka honey in uh, New Zealand and Australia, which has to ha contain a minimum number of pollen grains within the honey for you to, to call uh, that honey Nanuka because it has, uh, has very strict regulations in the country of origin in the United States. We don't really have a, an accurate or labeling law for honey. And so our labels for honey are very, can be deceiving. And so that's why we in Texas, for instance, recommend that you get honey only from sources that have the real Texas honey logo or label on them. That means that it's been certified as uh, being produced only in Texas and not other countries. But this field of Melissa Palynology is the one that allows one to deter determine the uh, taxonomic source uh, of the plant source that the bees are collecting nectar from by identifying the pollen they're in. Pollen is the male germ plasm of plants and honeybees and other pollinators have co-evolved with plants for millions of years so that plants provide a food resource, in this case, the uh, proteinaceous pollen, and in return, the pollinator will perform pollination services to allow for crossbreeding of the plant species. Pollen contains anywhere from 6 to 28% protein. And as you might see soon um, in, in some of the research, these numbers not only vary between plants, but also unfortunately vary among techniques used to determine the amount of protein in pollen. It contains about 5% lipids and sterols. And of course, it is essential for metabolism and for the consumption or gathering of certain sterols, uh, like the ones used for um, malting, which are not produced by the bees themselves. They have to collect it from plant sources in order to utilize them. But when a bee goes and foragers for pollen, she comes back to the nest and doesn't really just start consuming the pollen right away. What they do is, unlike honey, they don't have unloaders. The pollen collector goes and deposits the pollen in her hind legs herself and puts them into whatever cell is available that's open. And then they start packing it while secreting some other enzymatic secretions and they start packing the pollen just like it's seen in this picture and you see a bunch of different layers because the uh, pollen comes from different plant sources and so by doing this packing and adding some of these uh, gland secretion it is helping to prevent the germination of the pollen grains therefore helping to preserve the nutritional value of the pollen for the consumption of bee, by bees later on. It takes about 125 to 145 milligrams of pollen to rear one worker larva, but that only contains about 30 milligrams of protein because the rest is unusual material or cellulose and other plant material that's not really nutritious. So, why is pollen important to honeybees? I kind of briefly mentioned it contains the macronutrients, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. It also contains micronutrients, minerals, vitamins, and sterols. And 
something that's really important is that honeybees don't really co have considerable amounts of protein or lipid reserves in their bodies. You can imagine they have a small body and they're working really hard all the time. So they're constantly fueling up with either nectar or honey and bee bread from inside the colony. In particular, they need the protein to produce what are known as the egg yolk proteins, in particular vitellogenin, which is a glycolipoprotein that is needed for egg generation and is produced in the fat body of the honeybee. It also circulates in what is known as the hemolymph or the blood of the bees and at the production site. So here we have a picture of a very healthy bee that has very plump, well the fine fat body, and as the name indicates, these fat body tissues contain a lot of fat that is therefore later used for all the uh, metabolic processes in the bee. Whereas on the left, we have a skinny bee that doesn't have a lot of fat body tissue and therefore doesn't have any reserves that could help them for any generation of vitellogenin or any other egg yolk proteins, especially for uh, brood rearing. Pollen is really important for honeybees, especially if the bees are consuming polyfloral uh, nectar. And so this is, I guess, um, one of the things that you guys would be most interested in is the fact that bees need diverse diets, just like we do and, and, and most organisms new, uh, need. So around 10 years ago or so, people started doing a lot of research on the effects of polyfloral diets on honeybee immunity and health. And so they, this study that I show you here was one of the pioneering studies in 2010 that showed that um, polyfloral diets has positive effects on the immunocompetence of bees, including uh, their foraging behavior, antioxidative functions, resistance to stress, and longer lives. So what they did was they compared bees that were reared in the monofloral versus a polyfloral pollen diet and compared the glucose oxidase activity or GOS activity, which is a proxy for immunocompetence in insects. And of course, they found that uh, polyfloral diets induced a higher glucose oxidase activity in the polyfloral diet versus the uh, monofloral diet. Workers are unique in honeybees in that they are progressively fed by nurse bees. Nurse bees are the ones that are taking care of the baby larvae. So honeybees are what we call pollen metabolist insects. Those are the ones that undergo full metamorphosis. They have an egg stage, a larval stage, a pupal stage, and an adult stage. The X stage for all insects is the stage of uh, cellular development. And there's no feeding happening during the X stage. During the larval stage is where you see most of the feeding. There's no feeding during the pupal stage. So at the larval stage, which for honeybees takes about five to six days, the worker bees, the nurse bees that are known as nurses because they're nursing the baby bees, will progressively feed the larvae as they grow. This is very different from most other insects where especially solitary bees, for instance, the mother will lay an egg and then put a food provision next to the egg and close up that little cell and she will never see her young again. And when that egg hatches into a larva, they will eat their food that the mom left, whatever amount that was, and then they will pupate and then come out as adults. In honeybees, there is progressive provisioning of the larvae. Therefore, the nurse bees have to constantly be feeding themselves with pollen from the bee bread plus honey uh, to produce the uh, food that they feed to the baby bees. Most of the, in, in the young cases, the first three days of larval life, the baby bees are fed directly by the nurse bees, but older larvae, and, and they're only fed secretions from the bee's glands, from the nurse bee's glands. The older uh, baby bees in the fourth and fifth instars or fourth and fifth larval days 
can directly be fed honey and a little bit of pollen. But in general, bee food is created by the hypopharyngeal glands, which are comprised of these little uh, racines or little balls that we called acini, and that will come into play soon. So the acini are the little grapes that comprise the hypopharyngeal glands plus the mandibular glands in the head of the nurse bee. And so the, the worker larval food is typically made up of a ratio of two parts mandibular gland, nine part mandibular gland secretion, and then three parts pollen. The emergence weights and times of these baby bees upon emergence as adults will be definitely affected by the amount and the quality of food they receive. If a colony goes drastically in a dearth period, where there's either a naturally high rain or a naturally hot temperatures in the spring or summer, the nurse bees will not have enough food to feed the baby bees. And so they might stop the rearing of the young altogether. They may uh, shorten the amount of larval development that the bees are gonna have. And when they emerge, they're gonna come out much smaller in size. I'm gonna look at the chat just to see if there's any questions. Someone is saying, what a wealth of information you're feeling. So I'm, I'm hoping that this is a good thing because I'm not really an expert in plants, I'm an expert in, in bees. So I'm telling you how the bees are processing the food that you guys are giving them when you plant all of your beautiful gardens. Something interesting about bees in terms of food dirt is that up to a certain point, adults will break down their own tissue to feed larvae in times of starvation. So they will use that fat body reserve, for example, if they don't have enough um, bee bread and uh, honey reserves, up to a certain point, however. So if, um, if the bees are not getting enough food past that threshold, they're going to start cannibalizing the larvae and the eggs not only because they don't have resources to feed them, but also because they, the eggs and larvae, turn into sources of protein for the starving adults. Adult bees feed themselves or are fed by other adult bees. So we call that auto feeding. So you go and get your own food from the cells or you get this allo feeding or trophallaxis, just like I explained earlier using nectar and honey as the energy source, and then pollen or bee bread for growth and development of all of those plants. And the nutritional needs of bees change, adult bees change with age. So nurse bees are more prone to consuming a protein heavy diet because they need all of that bee bread to produce uh, brood food. Whereas foragers are not feeding the young, they're only going to get food back and forth. So they mostly consume nectar or honey to carry out their, all of their metabolic needs. So this is a, a, a graphic showing the resource flow in a honeybee colony. You have nectar foragers that are coming in with nectar and then they get unloaded by the stores and they bring them back to the colony. As I said, they do the ripening of the honey, et cetera, and then they cap the honey. You have foragers that go to different floral sources uh, shown here in the different color pollen pellets, and they themselves go and put them into the cells. They create the bee bread that is then fed to the developing larvae by the nurse bees. The nurse bees also feed the developing and adult queens and drones. And we have water foragers that unload the water to other bees and they put the, either the water away or use it for the processes that I told you about earlier. So now I want to go into some of the studies that we have done related to pollen consumption in colonies. And one topic that I'm really interested in is most of my colleagues study questions about the pollen and the type of nutrition that bees receive in rural areas and agricultural systems and agro ecosystems. I have been interested in the urban side of the equation, what bees are collecting in urban environments and how that might affect their nutritional ecology. So first I wanna go over this study that we did 
with a large group of collaborators for different regions across the United States. This is open access, so I can you can either look this up or send me an email and I can email it to you. We did this study in four regions, uh, California, Michigan, Florida, and Texas, mostly Austin and College Station. So we, this, I really like this study because it was a collaboration with beekeepers. We had to locate beekeepers that lived in urban areas and we had to get 15 different beekeepers that were separated amongst each other by at least three to five kilometers so that we knew that the bees from each of the sites were collecting resources in different locations across the landscape. We had two colonies per site just in case one of the colonies perished during the experiment. And then one of our collaborators did what is known as geographic information system analysis, whereby he was able using land coverage maps to determine the percent of the area in a 2.5 mile radius around each colony that was developed because we were interested in urban environments and we only allowed um, sites that were at least 80% developed to be part of the study. And so what we did was we took pollen from each one of these colonies by using a front porch, what we call front porch pollen traps, which are little plastic collecting trays that we put at the entrance of hives and we either engage them or not. And if they're engaged, the bees that are coming in with pollen have to go through little uh, doors and they're not wide enough for the whole bee with the pollen pellets to go through. So as they're going through, their pollen pellets drop and there's a collecting basket at the bottom. And that's how we collected the pollen. We would engage the trap for about a week and then we would collect the pollen once a month for about a year and a half from all of these sites. And so then we would take the sample from each site, we would homogenize it. So we would take about 50 milligrams of pollen from each site, homogenize it, and then we would take a subsample of that and we would make it go through what is known as the acetolysis. So acetolysis is a chemical process that uses a nine to one solution of acetic anhydrin and sulfuric acid. It creates a combusting a very interesting chemical reaction that ultimately breaks down the pollen kit of the pollen grains that you're looking at. And this allows for the adequate examination of the morphological characteristics that are used for taxonomic identification of the pollen. If you don't acetylize the pollen, the pollen kit of most pollen uh, types among the same family, for example, looks very similar. So, uh, this example is from two plant species in the same rosacea family, a different genus. And you can see that when you don't acetylize the pollen, it looks very similar between the two species. It's very difficult to um, determine which is which. Once you acetylize the pollen and you break away that pollen kit, you are able to see the morphological structures of the pollen, which allow you to then identify it under the scope. And for that, you need either pollen atlases and or your own digital uh, atlas that you start creating for yourself. If anyone can do this because you don't need a, uh, a really powerful scope. You just may need a um, dissecting scope with a little bit of magnification. And then you, you just start comparing based on your size measuring stick and the morphology of the pollen to start identifying it. So this is a neat slide showing uh, magnolia pollen, willow pollen, grape myrtle pollen, and sweet clover, for example. So you can see the vast diversity just within that one slide. So we did this for four different states across the US, and then we divided the information uh, into categories by seasons uh, using the Julian calendar. How do you go about characterizing what is more predominant and what is less uh, common in each sample? For that, we use a technique that was developed in 1978 and it's still being used to date, which was created by Lovo et al., uh, which helps categorize pollen within a pollen sample, like the one that I just explained from a homogenate uh, amount of pollen into four different categories predominant, secondary, important minor, and minor. So what you do is you take that sample from your 
slide, and you decide that you're going to count either 100, 200, or 300 pollen grains within each one of these slides after you've acetylized them. And then you determine what proportion of each uh, of the total number of pollen grains, let's say 100, belongs to one taxonomic group. So for this category, the predominant category, if more than 45% of the grains belong to, let's say, crepe myrtle, then crepe myrtle is a predominant uh, pollen type. If only 16 to 45 per, uh, grains out of 100 belong to crepe, crepe myrtle, then you would consider that a secondary pollen type, et cetera, all the way to the minor category. And we separated our data into the four major seasons. Of course, in a few of the states, uh, there was not a lot of information in the winter because there's nothing blooming. I'm just going to give you the information for Texas. Uh, because we don't have time to go over the other states, but I just want to show you kind of the diversity of what we found in uh, the urban areas in Texas. So in the summer, we found that there was one predominant pollen type, and that was crepe myrtle. Not surprisingly, it became apparent that crepe myrtle is a really important pollen type in urban environments, at least in Texas, but it was also the case in other states. We found a couple of important minor groups, including clover and palm, and then 11 minor groups. That means that each one of those only contributed three grains per hundred. Um, and so we didn't have enough room to call them out. In the fall, things turned completely different and surprisingly, or maybe not to you guys, but to us, that there was one predominant type and that was an elm, so it was a tree uh, that provided the pollen in urban areas in the fall. And we had a secondary type by the daisies. Um, and then we had crepe myrtle as an important minor. And then we had 11 minor groups. And finally, in the spring, not surprisingly, at least to me, we found no predominant pollen type that was, let's say, preferred by the foragers. Instead, we had one secondary group that was the sumac. We had about eight uh, important minor groups, including roses and oaks, and then uh, 28 minor groups, 28 uh, minor groups in the spring, which shows the vast diversity of flowering plants that are collected in the spring, not surprisingly, because that's when there is the most diversity. So with all of this diversity and seeing how bees are um, collecting so much pollen to suffice their metabolic um, and nutritional needs, we want to see in many respects how we can accommodate the natural inclinations of foraging by honeybees in urban and suburban environments to what beekeepers are having to use in times of dearth to keep their colonies alive. And so this, study comes into play here. Honeybees prefer, it's been shown over and over again, that they prefer to eat multifloral, real pollen diets compared to anything that is either old pollen, monofloral pollen, or pollen substitute. And so this study that was done in 2019 compared how bees did in terms of number of adult bees plus the number of cap brood, which is an indication of colony growth in colonies that were either fed no, no diet, which would be the uh, negative control, this purple line, no diet at all. So they were basically starved for about 12 weeks um, in terms of um, protein, or they were fed, the, fed wildflower pollen, like the, the one that is the highest, not, um, shows the highest growth across time, or other products that are used by beekeepers to feed their bees in times of dirt, including this one here that showed the lowest growth in terms of colony growth, even compared to the ones that receive no diet. And so not surprisingly, you see that overwhelmingly the colonies that have been fed wildflower pollen perform much better than any other of the treatments. So why is that happening? Why are bees preferring to consume the wild flower real product compared to the, to the non-real product? And so with that in mind, uh, we 
started a collaboration with uh, my colleague, Spence Beamer, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And it's to look at uh, nutrition in honeybees under the geometric framework for nutrition. And so that's gonna be kind of a, a mouthful, but it's an up and coming field that's been around for over 10 years, but it's now being used more and more in other systems. And it's a state space modeling approach that helps explore how animals can solve the problem of balancing, uh, changing and multiple nutritional needs in a multi-dimensional environment. That's a mouth, but let me explain it in a graphical way. When you're consuming a diet, any food will have all of those components that I told you, the macro and the micronutrients. And so you can look at any one diet and break it down into its components. Typically for the purpose of nutritional ecology, people will look at mostly either amount of protein or amount of carbohydrate eaten. So if you put an animal in an arena and you only give them access to two foods that vary in the amount of protein and carbohydrate, so one is high in protein, low in carbohydrate, and the other one is high in carbohydrate, the low in pollen, in protein, you give them the choice and the animal starts making choices by eating. If they are feeding non-randomly and making choices, they will start eating from one of the diets until they reach an amount for carbohydrates. And then they move to the other one to get more protein and they start going back and forth until they reach an optimal balanced diet target. So this diet here in the blue rail signifies the one that has a high protein, low carb, and this one here, high carb, low protein. And this animal is making decisions of eating a little bit of each diet until they reach their target amount. And so it helps us understand how macronutrient ratios, for example, the amount of protein to carbohydrate affects the survival and physiology of the bee, of the individuals in the arenas or in the, in the cohorts because you can then follow these individuals over time and see how long they live or how they can withstand infection with diseases, which is at the end what I'll talk about. So first we wanted to determine whether there is an optimal macronutrient ratio in honeybees um, in a controlled diet environment. That's the, that was our, our main goal for this type of study. So the no hypothesis under no optimal ratio is that the bees don't regulate the nutrient intake and they consume macronutrients without any bias. They'll just eat anything that's in front of them uh, without taking care of or knowing what they're eating or making any decision. The alternative hypothesis that we were testing is that they regulate their diet consumption to adjust for nutritional imbalances. And so to answer all of that, basically that major question of whether bees are adjusting for nutritional environments and regulating their diet, we conducted four types of experiments that I will explain. The first one was a field no choice test using five frame colonies. So field, meaning it was outside, we wanted to see if bees were foraging for pollen in equal amounts when only given one type of pollen. So this is a no choice test. So this is our apiary at Texas a &M. And what we did was we created these five frame nucleus colonies. Those are typical in apiculture. When you start out new colonies, these are the type of colonies that you may get. Uh, they contain about five to 8,000 workers, five frames. You give them a frame of food, uh, same of brood and then some pollen, but then we would put them under these tents so that it would have no uh, access to food outside. That way it was a controlled environment and they would only eat the, eat the food that we gave them. So we starved the colonies of pollen for about a week. They only had access to the pollen that was given in the one frame and they ate it up before the experiment started. So they were practically starving or in need of more protein. And we gave them then a platform inside the tent that contained 
one of the two treatments. So each tent only had the one diet. One that we call treatment 9B and the other one that was called treatment 9R. So we had two types of colonies. One type of colony received nine plates of monofloral brassica pollen, uh, mostly canola basically, monofloral and water. And the other tent received nine plates of only rosa, monofloral rosa pollen and water. And we were able to identify that these were monofloral doing the uh, palynological study. And every day we would weigh the, the dishes and we would subtract the amount that was eaten per dish every day. And so we would count the amount of food consumed every day over a five day period. And so here are the results for the no choice experiment. This is gonna be very similar for most of these graphs that I will show from here on. This one kind of looks familiar to you because it's those nutrients rails for the geometric framework of analysis of nutrition. So the first thing that I wanna mention is here is that we did a protein and lipid analysis for the two types of pollen and they had practically the same amounts of protein. Brassica had 31%, Rosa had 27%, but they varied dramatically in the amount of lipid that they, the pollen contained. Uh, brassica pollen had 23% protein versus 9% in the Rosa family. Now on the top, you see the total amount of pollen collected in grams over time when you add up all the colonies, uh, sorry, all the days per colony in each one of those tents. And if you are able to see there's an a color gradient here because for each type of bar, it, it, every uh, color gradient in the green is one day of the experiment. So this is the amount of uh, pollen that was consumed on day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five for about almost 400 grams of pollen, of brassica pollen consumed over the five day period compared to only about 200 grams of pollen consumed of rosa pollen consumed, even though these bees had equal access to the same amount of food over the period. If you put the amount of, if you break down the amount of protein and lipid in each pollen type and take the amount of pollen collected overall, then you can put the total amount of protein and total amount of lipid collected by the bees under each diet. And that is about 50, 50 grams protein, 25 lipid for Rosa, but about 125 grams of protein and almost 100 grams of lipid under the brassica diet. Then we knew that, yes, indeed, they eat twice as much brassica pollen when not given a choice. What happens if you give them a choice and you give them both both uh, pollens at the same time? Are they going to eat them indiscriminately in equal proportions or what do they do? So we did the same thing with the 10, but instead of giving them uh, only one type of diet, we gave them two, di uh, two diets at once. So we gave them a choice, but we had two treatments. The bees were either given six dishes with rosa pollen and three dishes with brassica pollen. So twice as much rosa pollen available or six dishes of brassica and three of rosa, so twice as many brassica dishes available compared to rosa. And we tested them the same way for five days. And here are the results. Regardless of whether they had twice as much rosa pollen available, they still consumed uh, almost three times as much brassica pollen under both of the diets. So surprisingly, they are regulating the amount of food they're consuming. And interestingly, if you put them under those nutrient trails, they are regulating uh, for lipids specifically so that they reach the same amount of about 75 grams of lipid per colony under that five day regime. Very interesting results. So they are definitely reaching this optimum protein to lipid ratio, regardless of the amount of diet that is available for each one of the two pollen types. With that in mind, then we wanted to see whether you can manipulate the protein to lipid ratios of the diet and give the bees 
but in this case, not forager bees, but nurse bees, the option of selecting among these diets. So first we conducted no choice experiments, and then we conducted choice experiments. We are proud to say that we have created the first artificial diet where the protein and lipid content can be manipulated. So here we have protein and lipid uh, as in 35%, 35 parts protein, 15 parts lipid, uh, all the way to the extreme lipid content one. This, this picture look, is a little old, so the consistency of this uh, heavy lipid diet looks very kind of pasty, but at the end of our experiments, we were able to make them all look like this. So they're very edible by the bees. They will accept the diet, but they have a very different composition in terms of protein and lipid. So we did these choice tests now with nurse aged bees, which are the ones that consume the protein that they feed to the uh, baby bees. So the, the take home message when we gave bees these diets um, is that they preferred the diet that has the 30-20 ratio protein to lipid. And it means that for all the diets, they're trying to regulate their lipid intake just like we saw in the other study. Um, and they don't really like the extreme diets that are either uh, protein heavy or lipid heavy. Uh, they, want the, they like the one that has about a 1.4 to one ratio of protein to lipid, which is basically ideal for honeybees. And so not surprisingly, we found that these two types of, of pollen have not only differences in the total amount of lipids, but also differences in the total amount of fatty acids, which are really important to bees, and also in the elements that comprise uh, the pollen, including uh, things like phosphorus, potassium, iron, etc. So of course, you guys know that pollen is diverse and, and so that it will have all sorts of differences in sterile composition, protein, etc. So this is the first diet that was created for honeybees to allow us to manipulate those ratios. And they need, they seem to be, for all of these tests, they are regulating their intake to about a 1.4 to 1 protein to lipid ratio. And the take home message of this is that not surprisingly, this protein to lipid intake target is what is found basically out in nature, what they're consuming. And it's very different to what the beekeepers are giving them uh, in times of dirt. They are giving them protein supplements that are incredibly high in crude protein amount. I mean, it says like no more, no less than 56% or 48% protein and very little fat. And we actually should be paying closer attention to what the bees really are looking for in the protein and lipid content in their food to provide them with better nutrition, especially during dirt. If I have time, you know, in the future, I could talk to you about what we're doing with Alex and other students to see if the bees can use these different um, macronutrient ratios in these diets to see if um, we can help them combat things like the form wing virus, which is a really horrible bee uh, pathogen that is transmitted by the varroa mite shown here, or other things like nosema, which is the microsporidium gut pathogen. And we're actually finding really cool results that seem to indicate that different macronutrient ratios can be applied to stress bees to increase their survivorship and development. We have some questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, and, and actually there, this has come up a couple of times, in what, as which native plants are best for the ratio of protein and lipids or what's the best plants for the bees, native plants? Uh, so uh, the, the answer is one that you're not really going to like, but um, what we always respond to that, to that is get something that is going to be polyfloral, seed mixes that will be flowering in both the spring and fall, especially in the fall when there is pollen dirt. And it depends on the uh, stage you're in. And in central Texas, um, there are a few resources that will tell you which of them, especially for this group, the native plants that are available for pollinators. Companies like the Native American Seed Company have uh, seed mixes that flower in our area, both in the spring 
and the fall. So I would encourage to do diverse seed mixes that are not only spring blooming, but also doing things that are going to be large, the larger, the better of the patches that you can plant, a plant that has inflorescences compared to one flower plant, uh, because the bees will then have this site fidelity whereby they can come and get a lot of different loads from the same patch of flowers before it runs out of, of resources. So planting larger patches of a few diverse plants that bloom in spring and fall is what I would recommend. Nothing specific. I mean, I, I don't know the names of them. I, uh, there's some resources that provide all of that information about what, what um, zinnias, uh, you know, the, um, what you just said, the Indian uh, blanket. There's a couple of plants that um, Dr. Mike Arnold here in the Department of Horticulture is testing in terms of pollinator attraction and how they can be used as companion plantings for edible crops like peppers and melons and cucumbers. And we're seeing a lot of really cool results in that regard. We have a very active Facebook page. Um, th that's where we post all of our training, all of our classes, all of our students, presentations, papers, etc. So I highly encourage you to join our Facebook page, Tamu Honeybee Lab. We also you look it up the same on Instagram and that's where we publish everything that's being done at the lab. One of the questions that came in earlier was the role of the Africanized bee and is that still a problem? So Texas is a state that has mostly, let me put it this way, the unmanaged population of honeybees in Texas is probably about 98% Africanized. So any swarms that you see out there in um, mostly rural or uh, areas will likely be Africanized. And they are the same species as the what you guys or people typically call the European honeybee. They're the same Western honeybee species. They're just a hybrid that has genetic makeup that comes from Africa and Europe. And so the Africanized honeybee has proven to be quite productive in South America, Central America, and now the Southern US, and people have learned to manage it. So there's a lot of beekeepers here in Texas that solely manage Africanized honeybees because they don't really requeen or buy queens from of, of European descent. They seem to be doing fine. Thank you, Julian, so much for a very in-depth and uh, well-presented uh, discussion. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you for the invitation.